it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I work in Groningen, the University of Groningen in the north of the Netherlands. I'm based at the Groningen Center for Health Law and also at the Aletta Jakob School of Public Health. And I'm going to start with an introduction to uh, my background, which will give you some more grounding uh, as to what uh, I do and why and how I work in the field of global health law. First, let me introduce my team to you. I have various colleagues who do interesting things in the field of global health law that may be of inspiration to you. Uh, in the middle below, you see um, Natalie Abrokva, and last week she defended her PhD on the right to mental health. And uh, that book was published with Intersensia, and I think it, it might interest some of you. For example, on the left top, you see Marlies Hesselman, who recently published uh, her PhD on the human right to energy services. Also, I think a worthwhile topic for, for some of you to explore. And you see other names and topics on the slide. And if you would like to get in touch, just get in touch or feel free to uh, contact me. And also some background, uh, if you allow me, uh, on what I will be talking about uh, today is uh, in the middle, you see the research handbook on global health law that gives uh, an introduction to, to global health law. To the left, you see, and it's uh, accessible online, uh, 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 sort of a, a, a smaller booklet into um, global health law and a couple of dimensions of it. And on the right, you see a book more focusing on health and human rights that we published last year and that we also use in our teaching um, at the University of Groningen Faculty of Law in our master course, International Health Law. So uh, there are some new initiatives that I would like to inform you about. There is a, now a consortium in global health law bringing together experts from the field. Uh, and what I find very important and it may be a source of inspiration is talking to each other really helps uh, to, to move and develop the field. And one of the things that was published uh, recently was a set of principles and guidelines on human rights and public health by Habibi et al. We're also working on a journal uh, of global health law with Edward Elgar publishing. Issue one is in the making. And uh, if, if you're interested in making a contribution or if you know anybody who's interested, uh, feel free to, to get in touch with me. What am I going to do? I'm going to talk about, oh, something is happening. Are we still seeing the screen? Are you still seeing the screen? Yes. yes. Okay, um, something happens on my side. Let's see. Oh, here it is. Sorry, maybe I, uh, apologies, I pressed a certain button. So I'm going to talk about the nature and scope and challenges of global health law, its dimensions, and, and yeah, more generally ask the question, what is it? So I'm going to talk about health, global health law as an emerging branch of public international law. But what I'm also increasingly working on is, is health law in its broadest sense. And I think it's important that we start perceiving health law as a multidimensional field, not just medical law at the domestic level, but a field that interacts with many branches of the law, uh, including domestic private law, public law, maybe think technology law, for example, but also with international standards in the field of health, um, the field that is emerging as global health law, human rights, but also other sciences, including health science, health economics, and so forth. And then the question uh, is, of course, uh, what do we know about global health? Most of you will be lawyers, and so you may uh, try to address this question for yourself. What is the life expectancy of the world today? And this question is taken from a very interesting book called Factfulness by health scientist uh, Hans Rosling. Uh, a Swedish scientist who wrote this um, interesting book. And the question, the answer to, the, to this first question is 70 years. And, and what uh, Hans Roslin um, shows here is uh, that life expectancy has risen. And in fact, um, in, in the 19th century, uh, life expectancy was only 40 years. So, so it's, it's, it's gone up. Uh, um, uh, considerably, and, and things are not as bad as you think. 
Uh, same with this question. How many of the world's one-year-old children have been vaccinated? Is it 20, 50, or 80 percent? Um, the answer is 80 percent. And again, it shows that um, we have made tremendous progress when it comes to global public health. But at the same time, many challenges remain. And I could only find a list from 2019 showing a number of threats that may all be very familiar with you. Uh, COVID-19 is not included, but it doesn't mean that the, the list is no longer relevant. And you can see that air pollution and climate change are on top of the list. So these are things to work on and they uh, beg for answers from the perspective of international law. We can also say that science is an important driver for international law and for the adoption of new standards. So that brings me to global health law. What is the nature? What is the scope? And uh, if we talk about international laws for global health, we see that a lot of achievements have been made. Um, so broadly speaking, we see that international law has encouraged the adoption of stronger laws for tobacco around the globe. We see that there's, thanks to international health law, more collaboration in infectious disease control. We see that there is protect, the protection of health-related human rights. But there are also a lot of challenges and opportunities. We want more influence uh, on food and alcohol regulation around the globe. We want, with, with the use of international law, reduce antimicrobial resistance. We want, for example, also strengthen, to strengthen access to affordable medicines globally. These are just some examples of the many challenges that remain. Now, uh, that brings me to uh, global health law. And what kind of undertaking is it? Why do we have it? What are its normative foundations? What is the role that human rights play in global health law? What are the sources of global health law? What is the role of the standards of the World Health Organization? What are the opportunities for new laws? And what is the role of soft law? These are the questions that I will try to ad address. And um, I cannot see the chat here, but if anybody has a pressing question, then Dimitrios, please feel free to interrupt me. I'm more than happy to answer any questions that uh, may arise. So what is global health law? Is it a collection of thoughts? Is it an area of practice? Can we truly speak of an emerging branch of international law? Is it an established branch of international law? And that also raises the question, what does it take for an area of practice, something that we talk about, to be a branch of international law? Do we need a certain amount of standards? Do we need a certain amount of coherence? Or is it sufficient that uh, global health law is being talked about, that we write about it. Why is it important? I think you will agree with me that health is an important social need, uh, a societal need, and important for the protection of our well being and our dignity. I think you will agree with me that globalization has implications for the protection of health around the globe. Take the increasing um, export of unhealthy products to many parts of the world. And what we also see is that law has an important role to play in protecting health-related concerns. And there you see a traditional focus, uh, starting in the 19th century with a focus on infectious disease control, moving towards a new and more broad focus, more on, on issues of lifestyle, non-communicable chronic diseases, environmental degradation, and so forth. That brings me to the question of definition. You've heard me using the terms international health law and global health law. So what is the distinction and, and, and what's, what, what is the term that, that is now most commonly used? I think the term that is now most commonly used is global health law. But in the past, we've seen more use of international health law and, and maybe international law, health law is a term that aligns better with the other names that we use in international law, international environmental law, international humanitarian law, uh, but maybe more narrowly international health law has more emphasis on the spread of infectious diseases. I'm not sure, but what I do see is that currently 
global health law is the most frequently used term, despite the fact that it may be a bit confusing, this term global. But health uh, in global health law is seen as a global concern, transcending national borders, and also accommodating the role of non-state actors. And Suri Moon writes more about that in chapter two of our research handbook on global health law. Then what are some normative foundations of global health law? And here I find inspiration in the work of two scholars, Jennifer Pra Ruger and Sridhar Venkatapuram, who both have developed a theory of health justice and saying, very broadly speaking, that society has an obligation to maintain and improve health based on the principle of human flourishing or human capability. And Venkatapuram speci specifies this by suggesting that there, that there is a certain health capability approach. And this is everyone's entitlement to a capability to be healthy. What do we need to um, pursue our life plans? That is the idea and that is what states should guarantee. And that comes, of course, very close to the realization of human rights, including the right to health. What is the scope of global health law? On this slide, I make a very rough sketch of what are some important standards under global health law. I'm fully aware that another scholar would make another overview, but this is how I roughly see it. I see the core standards, human rights standards, uh, and the standards of the WHO, the World Health Organization. I'll come back to that later. And then you see some related regimes. And in these related regimes, we see both synergies and tensions in the sense that international humanitarian law and international environmental law are also aimed at protecting health. And the UN drug control treaties and international trade standards have in principle other goals and there may be tensions. Uh, so we see both synergies and tensions in global health law. And um, that brings me to the next slide that uh, an important theme that emerges when studying global health law is regime interaction. How do these various regimes under global health law or under international law when it comes to protecting health interact? And that brings me to article 31 3C of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, uh, which says that there should be interpretation in light of any relevant rules um, of international law. And that is the concept of systemic integration. So um, if you look at trade, for example, it, it, it means taking a slightly more positive approach. Trade is not necessarily good for health, but uh, international trade law generally protects bona fide health measures is what we see. And that is also what the research by Megan Bayer uh, uh, reveals. Um, an example are the plain packaging re reports of the World Trade Organization. Um, the outcome of this was that Australia's law was not in consistence with international trade law standards. So states can actually go quite far in adopting measures that have an impact on the free flow of goods. So there isn't necessarily a, a, a per se, clash between international trade law and global health law. Then the next question is, what are the sources of global health law? And if you think about sources, that of course brings you to the statute of the International Court of Justice, um, and uh, the, the, which uh, authoritatively uh, enumerates the, 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 the sources of international law, conventions, international custom, and general principles of law, and as subsidiary means, judicial decisions and doctrine. And what we immediately see there is that soft law is not mentioned, and that, that begs the question, how authoritative is uh, the this statute of the International Court of Justice? Uh, or, but at, uh, at least soft law plays an important role, and I'll come back to that uh, in a second. Now, the, here's a piece of, 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 of research and questions that is still uh, undeveloped because the question of, of how global health law responds to Article 8 statute of the International Court of Justice 
I, I keep misspelling the word statute, uh, sorry about that, isn't uh, so developed. Um, if we look at treaties under global health law, we see a number of treaties, but under the, the chapter of the World Health Organization, only one treaty has been adopted, the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, so that's quite limited. We also see other treaties, so that field is, is quite fragmented. But what about custom? Can we draw here uh, custom from, from domestic health law, uh, for example, these well-established um, standards like privacy, confidentiality, could those be customs in global health law? Uh, I'm curious to hear your views on that. And what about general principles who may emerge domestically and internationally? And are principles which have emerged internationally like equity, solidarity, and proportionality than emerging principles in global health law? And when it comes to judicial decisions, then of course we can look at international, regional, and domestic decisions. And um, I would like to give one example from the domestic level, which is the judgment of the Constitutional Court of South Africa in treatment action campaign, where very explicitly the court applied the international framework on the right to health to, um, to uh, claim that um, everyone or women in South African society had access to an HIV drug. A very uh, inspirational judgment um, for courts and legal practitioners around the world. And when it comes to doctrine, of course, we should recognize the importance of writings from, from scholars from around the world working in the field. Global health law and the standards of the World Health Organization. Um, one step back, a little bit of history. Uh, 19th century, a cholera outbreak, which led uh, to the organization of a number of sanitary conferences, which led to the adoption of a convention, a sanitary convention, which then was revised uh, on a number of occasions, and the last one in 1969. And then um, the 1969 sanitary regulations were uh, again uh, amended to the extent that we currently have the international health regulations, which we have been adopted in 2005, which have been so important and authoritative in the COVID-19 crisis. In the meantime, in uh, 1948, uh, the World Health Organization was established, which was a follow-up of the uh, World Health Organization. And how did that go? We saw a UN conference in 1945, uh, where um, there was debate about the importance of health and medicine in, in our global society. There was, for example, a memorandum from Archbishop Spellman, who said, and I found that, find that very interesting, in this time, era of post-war idealism, he said, listen, medicine is a pillar of peace. And all this thinking led to the adoption of the constitution of the World Health Organization in 1946. And there's a spelling error because it should say that in 1948, the World Health Organization became formally active. Now, so the core of global health law is constituted by the laws of the World Health Organization. And I think the important foundation is offered by the constitution of the World Health Organization, which was, uh, well, adopted in 1946, and which gives this definition of health. Health is complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease. A very absolute definition that has also been criticized, but I think the beauty in this definition is in the recognition that health is not only physical, but also encompasses mental and social well-being. Um, and then a link to that, uh, a, an important milestone, the recognition of health as a right. Can you imagine that this thinking was already there in 1946 for the World Health Organization to be uh, established, but also to recognize in its preamble that health is a human right which was later shaped further by uh, the UN uh, treaty, uh, UN human rights mechanisms. I'll come to that later. The constitution of the World Health Organization also encompasses the legislative powers 
of the World Health Organization. It can adopt treaties and it can adopt international regulations. Uh, and these regulations are also binding for, 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 for the member states of the World Health Organization. So if you become a member, you're bound by the uh, regulations uh, with the possibility of opting out. And there we see the international health regulations that I just mentioned uh, of 2005. And then there's also a lot of non-binding recommendations. I'll come back to that later because this is the, there you enter the area of soft law. And of course, um, uh, these, these recommendations have also been quite influential. For example, the International Code of the Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes is very important. Um, the binding instruments. First, let me, let me address the question, why is there so little law? Why has the World Health Organization adopted so little law? One of the explanations is that not so many lawyers work within the World Health Organization. So we need more lawyers on board of the World Health Organization. And so I'm glad that I have some listeners today so who maybe one day work as a lawyer or a semi-lawyer within uh, the uh, World Health Organization. Who knows? But the two binding instruments, I've already mentioned them, are the International Health Regulations and the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. And the international health regulations, I, I've already said, were truly important uh, during COVID-19, have also been criticized heavily, but it is the best we currently have. And uh, so um, if there is an outbreak of um, some public health hazard in your country that is uh, potentially a public health uh, emergency of international con concern, you need to report to the World Health Organization within 24 hours. Then the WHO may declare that there is such a public health emergency of international concern. It may make recommendations, there's no sanctions. That is an issue of the big debate. But let's face it, let's be grateful for the fact that at least we have this. And currently the IHR are under revision. Then there is the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Uh, one of the most widely ratified treaties uh, of the United Nations, 181 state parties. It, it encompasses open-ended provisions in, in relation to, to the regulation of tobacco, but uh, research, uh, scientific research suggests that many uh, domestic states have altered their domestic uh, tobacco regulations, laws, uh, in response to the adoption of this treaty. So in that sense, we, we can say it, this treaty is a great success. And we've seen, uh, especially in the Netherlands, uh, a lot of domestic court cases in connection to the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. You cannot see it currently on the slide, but under the word domestic court cases, there's a link to an article that we wrote in which you make an inventory of all the Dutch court cases in relation to tobacco control. We have a system in the Netherlands that is uh, monist when it comes to the implementation of international law. So you can go directly to court on the basis of a treaty, which makes that we are such an interesting legal laboratory. The Framework Convention on Tobacco Control is super interesting. And this uh, is one of the most interesting provisions and important provisions of the treaty. Article 5.3 of this treaty is, says that uh, parties um, in, in well, if, if I may translate this freely, in adopting new tobacco laws and policies should not talk to the tobacco industry. And that's, of course, extremely important. And it has an impact, has had, a, uh, I've, I've seen it with my own eyes that this provision has had a really important impact in Dutch uh, policy and in our interaction uh, with the tobacco industry to the extent that there's much less interaction at the moment. What we also need to talk about is new standards, new standards to be adopted within the framework of the World Health Organization. We need more lawyers there and we need the adoption of more standards because there are so many challenges in health, in global health that need to be addressed. And so we could talk, for example, about a treaty regulating diets, a treaty regulating alcohol. Uh, and those treaties could be grounded and inspired by the existing framework convention on tobacco control. And on this slide, you see some other examples as well. So a treaty regulating diets could regulate the points of sale, could regulate the content of products, could regulate the packaging of products, uh, could prohibit the marketing of unhealthy products. We 
uh, we live in an obesogenic environment, so there are many challenges in making sure that people consume healthier diets and potentially such an international treaty. It's very challenging, I know, could play a role in this. And let's at least have a conversation about this. What could such a treaty look like? And what does, this, this, what does it take for such a treaty to be adopted? A pandemic treaty is the other uh, big debate currently uh, going on. Uh, so there would be then a pandemic treaty existing next to the international health regulations. It was initially an initiative from the European Union, and there is now a debate about this uh, within the intergovernmental negotiating body, uh, uh, the World Health Assembly. And um, there are many topics that could potentially be uh, addressed. Um, uh, in this pandemic treaty, uh, at the bottom you see, for example, equitable access to vaccines and other medical countermeasures, uh, a very important topic, and it would, would be very worthwhile uh, for such a treaty to uh, address uh, this. But uh, it also raises uh, many uh, important uh, yeah, questions. Um, the fact that the, then uh, there would be two parallel regimes uh, regulating the same or similar matters in different silos, and this could exacerbate the fragmentation of international law, as I already uh, suggested. So this is a really important debate. I would certainly not um, suggest that I'm an expert on this, but I try to follow this discussion uh, from, from the background. And here you can click if you want uh, to, to look at the statement uh, from the Global Health Law Committee of the International Law Association in which I uh, participate. Global health law and human rights is another important uh, dimension. We can say that, yeah, I would argue that human rights are the foundation of global health law, both economic, social and cultural rights and civil and political rights, and that we need to take a holistic approach to human rights when it comes to uh, global health law. Of course, the right to health is the most, um, yeah, I would say key right in global health law. Um, and uh, I could give a whole lecture on the right to health. I'm not going to do that. Picture on the left, I think, summarizes nightly, nicely what uh, the right to health entails. It's not only a right to health care services, but it also secures the right to the underlying determinants of health or social determinants of health access to things like water, food, uh, environmental conditions, uh, health, education, uh, and information, and so on. And the right to health translates into the AAAQ, uh, well established. You find it in general comment 14 uh, of the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. And it says that states have to secure the availability, accessibility, acceptability, and quality of all health-related services. And that's a really important and useful framework when you talk about the right to health also in more uh, policy uh, oriented settings. Yeah, and there are so many topics that uh, you could think and write about when it comes to human rights in health. And here are just some topics that uh, my students write about, that scholars write about. For example, uh, women's reproductive health is, is, is a topic that um, many of my uh, students address in their thesis. Uh, they find um, yeah, the issue of abortion and access to abortion is, for example, a, a topic that, uh, that they are often very engaged with. Um, but increasingly also environmental health concerns and also what is an important uh, emerging topic is uh, the, the, the connection or interaction between the protection of public health and human rights, which raises many complex issues under human rights law. Now, an important um, body for healthy human rights, sorry for focusing on the European context, but uh, the European Court of Human Rights doesn't uh, protect the right to health explicitly, but there are a number of rights in the European Convention on Human Rights that uh, are relevant for the protection of health. And if you look at the body of case law of the European Court of Human Rights, that you see that it pays extensive, this case law, attention to a many health-related concerns. Um, and the court has come up with far-reaching judgments in the field of health and med medicine. 
um, environmental health concerns, uh, access to abortion, the issue of euthanasia, uh, access to care, and so forth. So it, I really recommend you, if you're interested in this field, to, to study the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, the Strasbourg Court of the Council of Europe. The role of soft law in global health law is, is also an important um, uh, matter to think about. And uh, I find the writings of uh, the scholar Pauline interesting. He, he says, yeah, our societies have become very complex and um, soft law ha has become an, an important tool to address these interactions between all these actors. And it, it fills important regulatory gaps. And uh, in global health law, we see a wide range of standards carrying various levels of authority. But I think this is a matter that could be studied for further. Uh, it cannot be overlooked. Many actors interact with, with uh, global health law. And some examples you see here on the slide. For example, uh, the, the human rights general comments of the human rights treaty bodies are an important source of soft law for, for global health law, I, I would say. That brings me to some uh, final observations about global health law, summarizing what I've just said. Uh, I would like to, to state, and, and, and you can disagree with me in the, in, in the discussion uh, later, that global health law is a recognized branch of international law. I would argue that human rights is an important pillar of global health law. I would argue that global health law has important implications for domestic settings, that we need to be aware of uh, systemic integration within global health law, but also within public international law more generally. We need to talk about the potential of new standards, for example, a food treaty, a treaty regulating antimicrobial resistance. We need to talk about the potential of expanding the laws of the World Health Organization. And we need to talk about the role of hard versus soft law. Are we happy with soft law or do we want more hard law? Allow me a little bit of promotion, Dimitrios. We have some summer schools in, in Groningen starting next week. Uh, and in two weeks time, we have human rights and global health challenges. Maybe a bit late, but uh, maybe for next year, uh, or maybe there is still a spot. But um, that said, I thank you very much for your attention and um, I'm open for any questions and comments that you may have. So I think I uh, will stop uh, sharing the slides now. Thank you very much, dear professor, for this very interesting uh, lecture. And I'm uh, sure that all the participants, including me, learned a whole lot about this very sensitive matter of international law. Dear ladies and gentlemen, are there any questions to our dear Professor Tubis? I would have one, but I'd rather not be the first one to go. So. Dear ladies, do you have a question for me? Otherwise I feel so lonely in this room. <laughs> Maybe you could, you could also think about the impact of the international health regulations on your own native countries. And if you've seen, um, that would actually also be my question. So I, I don't see any I, I will just shoot. Um, we've learned a whole lot about this um, considerable wealth, I'd rather say, of international uh, international uh, health uh, regulations. How about the the topic of, of compliance? And do you think that the inter instruments of international law are enough in order to make sure that everybody is aboard? Thank you for that question, Dimitrios. I, I think uh, we had a very brief conversation about this. Um prior to uh, the start of this lecture. And it seems uh, that for me, uh, as an optimist, the glass is half full and for you, the glass is half empty. You are probably right, but I, 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 I just think that there need to be some believers in the room in order to, to continue. Um, so we've seen that the international health regulations um, 
have had uh, many flaws also during COVID-19. Um, one of the things that was heavily debated was the fact that, um, uh, well, the criticism that China was a little bit late uh, reporting to the World Health Organization that there was an outbreak, it, it maybe waited three weeks, but bear in mind that during Ebola, the West African countries uh, waited a few months. So there was already some progress. Um, and then as a result, of, in response to that, uh, the World Health Organization could only issue recommendations. And, and was that disappointing or not? That's a very difficult discussion, isn't it? Because had there been sanctions, uh, then how would countries respond to that? Um, would they be willing to collaborate with the WHO still? So I'm not sure. I'm very open to, to, to your views on this, but I feel that we are balancing uh, on a very fragile port in this sense, uh, making sure that the countries are on board. What I do think is very important in the international health regulations, and that is often overlooked, is this uh, issue of pandemic preparedness. Being prepared for the next uh, outbreak uh, is super important. And there are some provisions in the international health regulations that prepare for that. And I think it's very important that uh, this preparedness is, is monitored properly. Um, uh, in, and, and, and I think we should be aware that um, sometimes countries need assistance in order to be fully prepared. And it all hang, also hangs together a bit with having a properly functioning health system in the first place uh, for you to be able to respond to a pandemic. I do want a question from the room now. So I hope somebody will stand up. Thank you warmly. Dear, dear ladies, if I may help you, if um, you can mirror elements of international uh, health regulations, which our dear Professor Tubus has presented uh, before, uh, to your national experience. What would be your point of view? Yes, and bear in mind, there are no silly questions. It doesn't exist. Those are the simple questions are usually the best ones. So can you type something or open your video, uh, just ask anything you would like to ask. Also more practical questions. And it, it would be, if I may remark that, a golden opportunity. How often do we have the opportunity to talk about global health law? Indeed. So It's such an exotic field, isn't it? Yes, but super important at the same time, I would argue. Still no question, Dimitrios. Maybe they well, are typing. Oh, there, oh. Olga, Olga, yeah. you save us. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I will try. <laughs> so, um, first of all, thank you so much for such an interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I was uh, enjoyed and uh, it was really interesting. So my question is uh, about domestic law and global health law. For example, you said before that um, there are some regulations of, um, uh, regarding to, for example, uh, alcohol or um, diets or um, drugs. And as I know, uh, now in Germany, for, for example, uh, there is a big discussion about um, marijuana legalization. And uh, for example, in my country, in Russia, it's uh, not allowed. Uh, even marijuana, it means uh, very strong uh, drugs, and uh, you have to be punished uh, if you um, take this or sell it or something like this. And my question, how uh, global health law can regulate, can manage um, a different approach uh, in every country, for example? Yes, nice question. Thank you for your nice question. Um, uh, it, it raises many uh, sub-questions with me. Uh, I think a first remark is uh, that um, we uh, are, when it comes to regulation of drugs, we often see that 
countries uh, respond in a very prohibitive fashion, right? Drugs are here. And when it comes to alcohol, tobacco, food, we are more on the liberal side. We are increasingly regulating dimensions of these products. Huh? We are now increasingly regulating price, uh, the, 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 the marketing uh, of tobacco, and we are moving ahead with alcohol and diets, for example. So I think uh, alcohol, tobacco, uh, and diets are moving to the more prohibitive sphere, whereas drugs is potentially moving to the more liberal sphere in some countries. For example, in the Netherlands, we uh, tolerate uh, the use of marijuana under circumstances, and this is happening in, in more countries, but uh, many other drugs, including ecstasy, for example, are still uh, on our um, Opium Act on list one, meaning that they are seen as a very severe drug. Um, and your question is, how can we uh, regulate this uh, in a sense that uh, we draw one line uh, in relation to countries, or is it possible uh, to regulate this, given that countries have so many different approaches, right? Um, and my answer, okay, my answer would be that uh, we could make international law that is sound and driven, as long as it's driven by science scientific insights into what is the best approach when it comes to regulating tobacco. Let me give you an example there. We know tobacco is very harmful, mm -hmm. extremely harmful. And, and I think many of us will agree that tobacco and smoking should be banned as much as possible. And there is a lot of research has been done proving that an increase of tobacco products, making them much more expensive, reduces smoking. So then uh, you could see that um, international law could encourage states to regulate the price of tobacco. Um, I'm asking myself if the same could uh, apply to uh, drugs. And, and it brings me to the UN drugs treaties, which are quite, uh, well, those are more focusing on, on medicines as drugs, or but also drugs, yes. But these treaties are more prohibitive. So I am inclined to say that it is, I see very good opportunities for regulating tobacco diets and alcohol um, on an international level. But for drugs, I'm more confused. Mm -hmm. Do you have a response to that? I agree with you, actually, because for me, it's also a very difficult question and topic uh, to compare, as I said before, to my country, for example, because we have a very strong uh, rules and law uh, regarding to, to drugs and uh, yeah, to compare to Amsterdam, to Netherlands, for example, there is no problem with uh, marijuana and uh, for me so far i have uh, i have this question as well so yeah so you may want to look at the literature uh, that um, proposes a harm reduction approach which is based on human rights right mm. where the focus when it comes to drug use is not so much on prohibition but on mitigating the harmful effects of drug use mm. offering clean needles um allowing uh, the testing of of uh, ecstasy pills in certain settings for example uh treating drug addicts and so forth so so a human rights approach uh, to, to 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 drug use could could offer some some meaningful answers mm. okay. does that answer help you yes of course a lot thank you <laughs> so so are there further questions, dear uh, ladies, dear fellow participants? Well, if that is not the case, I'd like to thank our dear Professor Tubis for this very interesting lecture. Uh, and uh, again, 
we learned a whole lot uh, from your lecture. So thank you warmly. Thank you, Dimitris. Rios. And dear, dear, uh, dear ladies, thank you warmly for being here with us. Thank you also, dear Andrea, for providing the uh, electronic, uh, you know, room for us in order to be able to to meet each other. And I'd like to wish you all the very best. Take good care of yourselves and hopefully see you soon again. Thank you warmly.